yeah, pretty hostile is the short <laughs> answer to that question. Um, there's a load of things going on. I mean, there's a huge storm brewing around these black holes when they're feeding this quickly. Mm. So the first thing is the radiation. I mean, absolutely enormous amounts of radiation. This is about a quadrillion times the brightness of the sun. Um, if we think about the stars in a galaxy, this quasar is outshining all of the stars in the galaxy yeah. that it lives in. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson, particle physicist here again. I hope you've had a brilliant week and have a fantastic weekend in store. Now, last week, scientists claimed to have discovered and observed the brightest object in the universe. The object is a quasar, the bright core of a galaxy that is powered by a massive black hole, 17 billion times the mass of our sun. The object is designated J0529-4351, and the object's power has been confirmed by observations by the Very Large Telescope in Chile. This amazing object appears to have a voracious appetite, consuming the mass equivalent to one sun every single day. To help me understand the nature, discovery and implications of this amazing cosmic object, I'm joined by a brilliant special guest, Dr. Dan Wilkins. Dr. Wilkins is a research scientist, astronomer and astrophysicist at the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford University. His research focuses on how material spiralling into the supermassive black hole in the centre of a galaxy is able to release huge amounts of energy, powering some of the brightest objects we see in the universe. So I couldn't hope for a better special guest to help me dig into the mysteries of this ravenous cosmic phenomenon. So, uh, Dan, scientists claim to have discovered the most luminous object ever detected, an object designated J0529-4351. Always very exciting designations. Now, that's a, a very bold claim. Um, what is this object and what are its characteristics? What are we talking about here? So that J number you gave is a very boring way of naming <laughs> one of the most Something awesome exciting phenomena. and yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of the most awesome phenomena we see in the universe. So this is something that goes by a number of different names, um, different names like quasars, active galactic nuclei, Essentially, what we have here is a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy. Um, this one in particular is a black hole weighing as much as um, 17 billion suns. Yeah. Um, and this black hole has a huge amount of material falling into it. And as that material falls in, it gets superheated. It releases enormous amounts of energy. And that's what we're seeing um, as it's not technically the, the brightest thing we've ever seen in the universe, but it is the brightest continuous ah, source of light okay. we've ever seen in the universe. Yeah, very, very interesting. So he said 17 billion times the mass of the sun, this huge accretion disk, which is circling around, they said seven light years in diameter, roughly th that's roughly 15,000 times the distance from the sun to the orbit of Neptune and a brightness equivalent to 500 trillion suns. So as you correctly said, this is the brightest continuous uh, light source we've seen um, across the universe. So how far away is this thing and, and how was it discovered? Because I, I believe um, it's an object that we already knew about, right? But we didn't we hadn't classified correctly. Um, yeah. So this thing is 12 billion light years away from us. Um, so we're looking at an extremely distant part of mm. the universe here. Um, so just for context, at 12 billion light years away, that means the light we're seeing from it has taken 12 billion years to reach us. Um, our universe is about 13.9 billion mm. years old. So the universe was a lot younger than it is mm. today at the time that, that we're seeing this object. And and how and how was this discovered with a particular a particular instrument, a particular telescope? Um so this was hiding essentially almost like a needle in a haystack 
Um, it was discovered by combining two different giant data sets from right. um, missions that are known as astronomical surveys. Okay. Uh, so the primary mission here was something called Gaia. Um, Gaia is a European Space Agency satellite that sits in orbit, spinning around, literally scanning the whole sky and recording absolutely everything i, I remember a huge set of parallaxes or something you know all <laughs> these all these measurements for all these positions of stars in the milky way a, a massive sky survey that they that they and i think they keep updating the numbers right every few years of how many stars they've catalogued yeah so the more times gaia spins round the more things mm -hmm. it sees but also the more times it gets to look at each individual star and object so just the precision gets gets so much better um but the, the group that discovered this figured out that by combining the data from Gaia with data from another survey called WISE that's looking at a, it's a past survey that looked at um, infrared oh. emission from across the universe, um, combining and cross-matching things that Gaia detects and things that WISE detects in the infrared oh. is a really good way of spotting these quasars, these feeding supermassive black holes at huge distances across the universe. Um, so then once they discovered it, they obviously wanted to learn more about it. And I can see there you've brought up a picture of the, the very large mm. telescope in Chile. Um, this telescope, it's made up of four separate eight meter telescopes. Um, one of those telescopes has an instrument on it called X-Shooter, which is a spectrograph, um, essentially measuring the spectrum of the, the visible light coming from whatever you pointed at. Um, so it's by using X-Shooter on the, the very large telescope, they were able to get a close look at this object, um, figure out exactly what it is, get a good good idea of exactly how massive the black hole is and how bright it's really shining. Ah, amazing. So they discovered it and then they went and had a, a closer look with the, the very large telescope. So the, these characteristics you mentioned, so you mentioned... Um, that this has um, a massive consumption rate of material, and you mentioned obviously the the huge mass of the of the black hole. Um, where's the uh, where's the paper here? There's a paper that gave this exact number, wasn't there? Here we are, seventeen billion solar mass black holes, like you said. How are these um, these numbers um, determined from the from the information that we have? So the the mass of the black hole. Obviously, this is a very distant object. So the mass of the black hole, and then how do we know that it's um, the rate that it's feeding on material. Um, with great difficulty is the, the simple answer. Um, <laughs> I was so going to say, I, I was like, how the hell have they done this? Like, it must be incredibly complicated. Yeah. So I'll start with the, the easy one, which is the rate at which it's feeding on material. Okay. Um, so the first thing you have to do to determine that is figure out how much energy is coming out, mm -hmm. um, so how bright it is. Um, sounds like an easy problem. You just point your telescope at it and measure how much light we're seeing. Uh, but the problem we have is that we're only seeing a very small part of the spectrum mm -hmm. with any given instrument. So we need to do a bit of accounting. So we make all these measurements, um, not just looking at the total brightness, but looking at the shape of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So how much light is coming out at different wavelengths. And then um, I guess there's then, some extrapolation between, you know, guessing what the what, what the probable spectrum is that's actually being emitted by the by the object. Exactly. So we we use the bits of the spectrum we can measure. We extrapolate mm. and interpolate between them, get an idea of the shape of the spectrum we think over the whole spectrum, mm. and then try and integrate or add together mm. the total luminosity. So that's, that's how true. you figure out first of all how bright it is. Once you know how bright it is, then you can figure <laughs> out how quickly it's feeding. Um, and this is because um, most of the radiation that we see coming from quasars is powered by the gravitational energy of that material that's falling in. Ah, okay. And we know um, based on Einstein's theory of general relativity and our theories of the physics in the, the accretion disk, that depending on the exact properties of the black hole, um, if the black hole is um, not spinning, then if we take all of the, the energy that's stored in that material falling in, Einstein said the total amount of energy in material E is equal to mc squared, that we can think of that as the, the energy that's locked mm -hmm. up in the mass that's falling in. Um, if the black hole's not spinning, something like 6% of that energy comes out in the form okay. of light. Um, and other processes powered by the black hole. But if the black hole is spinning, then we can turn that up. That 6% turns into a huge 40% wow. of 
all the energy that falls in. And if you're talking about energy sources, this is by far the most efficient process in the universe, comparing the fuel that goes into the energy that comes out, mm. dropping things into a black hole under <laughs> the force of gravity is by far the most efficient. Um, so then if we assume that somewhere between 6% and 40% of the, the energy that falls in is what we're seeing coming out, that's where we can derive that, that number of one solar mass of material. So one sun worth of material per day is needed to keep this thing. So that's probably going to be somewhere in the middle of that range and it could be a little bit higher or it could be a little bit lower than that. But that's an amazing amount of material anyway. How about the the mass here? So how have they come across that mass of 17 billion um, solar masses for something that's so far away, it feels like that'd be very hard to do, but maybe there, maybe it's not. Yeah, luckily we've got some tricks up our sleeve. Good. And um, so the the key to to measuring the mass of a black hole, to weighing a black hole, is we need to watch something in orbit around it. Mm. Um, if we know something's in orbit, if we can measure the radius of that orbit, and we can measure the velocity of whatever's orbiting, then we can use essentially Newton's law of gravity. I mean, you can use Einstein's general relativity if you want, but actually Newton's laws work fine when we're talking about these huge distances from the black and, hole. And do we have enough resolution on something that's so far away to be able to, to see these objects around it and, and, and get those, those kind of measurements? So absolutely not is the, <laughs> the short answer. Um, so this is where we need some, some more tricks up our sleeve. Okay. Um, so the, the first thing that um, we need to do is find something to, to look at in orbit around the black hole. And what we look at are clouds of gas. And then we want to measure how quickly that gas is traveling in its orbit. And we can do that from the spectrum that X shooter measures. Um, there are particular lines in that spectrum, particular colors or particular wavelengths of light that are emitted by different chemical elements. In particular, we use the light emitted by carbon and magnesium is really good for, for weighing black holes. Um, and by measuring the, the light coming from carbon atoms and magnesium um, atoms, or I should say ions, actually, I mean, this stuff's so hot, um, in orbit around the black hole, what happens is the the, the lines in the spectrum get broadened by the dot ah, shift. So when the, the gas is in orbit around the black hole... It's going away and it's going towards and you're going to exactly. get... Right, I see. Ah, so if you measure how wide the line is in the spectrum, you can measure how quickly the gas comes towards us and how quickly it moves away from us. Um, so that's step one. Um, step two is after you know how fast the gas is moving, you need to know how far away it is from the black hole. Yeah. Um, in an ideal case, we'd have a telescope that can just resolve the gas and we can just yeah. measure it. We can't do that here. Yeah. Um, the second thing you can do is something called reverberation mapping. That's not something they've done here, but there what we're looking at are light echoes off of this gas. So every time the brightness of the light coming from around the black hole changes, the brightness of the emission we're seeing from the carbon or magnesium changes, mm. but there's a time delay between it. That time delay is how long light takes to travel from the black hole to the mm. gas. So that gives us a measurement. Mm. Um, though I said here, they weren't able to do that, unfortunately. That requires very sensitive measurements taken over extremely long periods of time. And um, so here is where they have to use a hack. Um, so it turns out when you actually do this measurement of the radius of these, these gas clouds away from the black hole for many, many black holes, we find there's a pretty good correlation between the total brightness, the total luminosity, oh, okay. and this radius. So what we can do is we can guess, based on how bright this object is, how far away these gas clouds are. It's not perfect, but it gives us a kind of order of magnitude to within probably a factor of 10 or so, a bit less than a factor of 10 on how heavy this black hole is. So we get like 17 billion solar masses, but that's probably plus or minus a few billion. <laughs> what's a few billion when we're up that high it's it's, it's, all, it's it's all fine so very very interesting absolutely amazing stuff so the question comes naturally with one of these things where if you're going to say this is the the brightest um continuously shining object in the, in the night sky is is there a limit for how luminous these objects can get or could this this record uh, this record this record be broken again fairly soon with with the opportunity to look at these 
data sets and combine them. Is there is there a limit to, to how far up we can go? Um, yes and no. So the the yes to that um, is a theoretical limit called the Eddington limit. So you mentioned and, this in our little chat before. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, so the Eddington limit essentially is when um, we've got material falling into the black hole and it's the, the force of gravity from the black hole that's pulling it in. Mm. But then the the light and the radiation that's getting produced as that material falls in and heats up then puts a pressure blowing outwards on the material that's trying to fall in. This is called radiation pressure. So, so people might not be fully aware of this, but the light that comes out actually has a momentum. So you might have heard of, of people using solar sails, for example, in the in uh, in space to propel spacecraft. These photons can ping off that mirror of a solar sail and they can actually push a spacecraft uh, along and uh, accelerate a spacecraft. So light creates an actual pressure when it's pushing back out from this black hole. And I guess if, here you're saying those are eventually going to come into a kind of equilibrium. They're going to balance one another. Exactly. So once you get to this so-called Eddington limit, then the, the radiation pressure, the force of the light pushing out, mm. is exactly counteracting mm. the gravity pulling the gas in. So if you go above that Eddington limit, and there's a few assumptions here, you're going to start blowing material away. So the black hole is going to choke off its own fuel supply. Um, the caveat to this, though, is that this assumes that the gas is falling in from all directions mm. and the light is coming out in all directions. Yeah. There are loopholes. We can actually get round the Eddington limit um, and nature does get round the Eddington limit. Um, there are neutron stars, so tiny little things by comparison, things weighing about the mass of the sun in our own galaxy mm. that we've discovered accreting material at hundreds or thousands of times their Eddington limit. Because if you've got the gas coming in through a disc mm. and then you've got the, the radiation coming out... Ah, they're, they're, the they're missing direction, each other, essentially. They yeah. miss each other. Um, though you do start getting into trouble if you try and keep things above this Eddington limit for too long. Because um, eventually that disc of gas that's falling into the black hole is going to run out. Mm. And when it does, you need other gas to fall in to replace it. Mm. And if you've got this great big light source in the centre of the galaxy yeah. blowing everything away, then you're probably still going to choke off its fuel mm. supply. Ah, very very cool. So, so this object that we were that we're talking about is probably close to its Eddington limit. Is that is that the idea that we we've got here? Um, yeah, depending on where we are in the error bar for the mass measurement mm. and the total luminosity measurement, we're either a little bit below the Eddington limit or a little bit above the Eddington limit. Yeah. We're just about on that mark. So we're probably not going to expect to next week find another one that, that smashes this this limit. It's possible, but probably not very likely. Is that is that fair? I think so. Okay. So So a little bit about what would the environment around around these objects be like? Because I, I've seen various quite kind of um, grandiose YouTube videos talking about, you know, the galaxy killers, quasars, the galaxy killers. What would the environment be around one of these objects? Presumably there'd be a highly irradiated area for, you know, many, many light years and we wouldn't want one pretty much close to Earth. So what, what would it be like around one of these these objects? Yeah, pretty hostile is the short answer <laughs> to that question. Um, there's a load of things going on. I mean, there's a huge storm brewing around these black holes when they're feeding this quickly. Mm. So the first thing is the radiation. I mean, absolutely enormous amounts of radiation. This is about a quadrillion times the brightness of the sun. Um, if we think about the stars in a galaxy, this quasar is outshining all of the stars in the galaxy yeah. that it lives in. So there's yeah, huge amounts of, of radiation coming out, mostly um, ultraviolet, mm. um, some X-rays as well, some visible light, some infrared. Um, the other thing that's going on, um, once things start feeding this quickly, um, is that radiation pressure we talked about. Mm. Um, it's Maybe or maybe not enough to blow all the gas away, but it's certainly enough to power a wind. Mm. So not only do we have this radiation coming out from the center, but we've got gas being blown off that disk mm. at huge speeds, blowing out into the galaxy that surrounds it. Um, and this is 
I mean, hugely important for our understanding of how galaxies grow. I mean, we think about black holes as being these great monsters that destroy everything around them. Um, but actually, in many ways, you can think of these things as the sculptors that are kind mm. of guiding the growth of their galaxy. Um, if a galaxy is growing by material falling into it from outside, and then that material that falls in is eventually going to fall stars. As material filters down to the center of the galaxy to feed this black hole, the black hole is going to try and blow away mm. the gas that's falling in to the galaxy. So this black hole is actually the agent that stops the mm. galaxy growing too big. And eventually this radiation and these winds that it's blowing will actually shut off the growth of new mm. stars in the galaxy. Um, and we actually think that, that every supermassive black hole goes through a phase like this. The, the black hole Sagittarius A star in the center of the Milky Way probably went through a phase like this early on in its lifetime. And it's this process that leaves the galaxies that we see today. Ah, so that that's that's actually, I think you've answered the question that I was going to ask next is, how do these objects form and, and how common are they? Because it seems like here you've got an incredibly massive black hole. It doesn't seem like this could come from the collapse of a, an individual star. <laughs> so so how has that thing come come to be and how common are these um, supermassive black holes and then quasars on top of that. Yeah, so um, supermassive black holes are extremely common. Um, our best understanding is that every galaxy in our universe, or at least every major galaxy in our mm. universe, if you don't count the, the little dwarf galaxies, mm. has a supermassive black hole mm. at its centre. Most of them aren't this big. Um, they're normally somewhere between a million and a billion solar masses. This is on that, that really massive end. Mm. Um, how they got there is a bit of a mystery. Um, there's kind of two theories. Um, and I mean, the reality probably lies somewhere between the two. So one way you can get this black hole is um, a very early generation of very massive stars in the center of the galaxy. Um, all those stars come to the ends of their lives. They form smaller black holes. And then those black holes merge with each other, leaving a bigger one. Um, and then the... The second theory for where these supermassive black holes come from is this is essentially the leftover material in the center of the galaxy, um, just material that's falling into the center of the galaxy, into the gravitational well that's been created by everything in the galaxy. And that material just keeps falling in. It gets compressed and compressed and compressed and eventually forms a black hole. Um, we don't know exactly how important those two processes are and actually it's these these really massive quasars that we're seeing at really large distances when the universe was really mm. very young that are really challenging mm. our theory here because both of those mechanisms for going black holes take time and if we're seeing something a billion years after the big bang and we've even seen these I mean, further away now, even earlier in the history of the universe, if we've got a black hole that's <laughs> 10 billion solar masses in the first billion years of the universe, how on earth did they grow that big in such a small amount of time? Does, does that lean us towards the second hypothesis there, that they they formed straight away out of these these gas clouds after the Big Bang rather than... We form stars first. Stars come to the end of their life, make black holes, and then they merge. Or is are they are they do they both take a lot of time, and it doesn't really give as much information to to, to distinguish between those two hypotheses that you mentioned? Yeah. So for these these really big black holes, it, it is leaning us very much towards that second hypothesis, okay. that direct collapse of gas. But even that's taking too much time. Mm. So we need to seed these things with something that's already quite massive. Mm. And we need to grow them very quickly. And this is where the Eddington limit comes back in. It, if we can grow these things in the early universe faster than the Eddington limit, that will solve a lot of these problems. If we can make these things grow very quickly early in the universe. Ah, very, 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 very cool. So I wanted to, 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 you alluded to the idea that Sagittarius A star, which is the supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy, could have gone through this this stage so so when we say a quasar are we really saying that it's a supermassive black hole which is in a particularly hungry 
um, aggressive feeding stage. So can supermassive black holes come in and come out of being in this uh, in this kind of quasar designation? Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, quasar or active galactic nucleus or many other terms for these objects refers to a specific stage in their life cycle when the supermassive black hole is feeding at a high enough rate to be powering these bright objects that, that outshine all the stars in their galaxy. Um, when they use up their fuel supply, mm. then they'll shut off um, and then they'll leave something more like Sagittarius A star, essentially just a fairly quiet supermassive black hole that nibbles on little bits of gas occasionally, but it's but it's nothing like, like these. Um, and then if more gas found its way into the center of the galaxy or something like a star wandered too close to the black hole, then it could light up again and it could start feeding again. Amazing. Really, really interesting stuff. So the, the final question that I have is, how are we going to get more information then on the... So, so you said looking at these these really massive, hungry uh, cosmic phenomena is very, very important. And to be able to work out what happened in the very early universe and how these things formed, that's a, that's a major open question. How are we going to get more information on this and resolve just how these supermassive black holes uh, form so quickly? Is this, is this going through these data sets, looking for more of these um, supermassive black holes? What, what's the, the kind of step forward for solving this riddle? So I think we need a multi-pronged approach here. Um, the first one is going to be really understanding the population of black holes that we're seeing in the distant universe, so mm -hmm. in the early parts of the universe. And this is an avenue that's really going to open up in the next few years. We've got a new telescope coming yeah. online later this year called the Vera Rubin Observatory. Yeah. That's going to do a huge survey of the entire night sky it can see from down in Chile. Um, and that is projected to find many millions of quasars or active galactic nuclei or supermassive black mm -hmm. holes. Um, we're in the process of a number of um, surveys with X-ray instruments at the moment, looking for the X-rays that these things produce. Um, the German Erosita mission just released their first big amount, big load of data. That's an X-ray survey looking for these things all across the sky. Um, and we're planning the, the next generation of X-ray missions as well. Uh, missions like Athena um, and a number of mission concepts we're working on here in the U.S., that are going to do, going to do these um, these types of surveys, just trying to find as many black holes in the distant universe as we can, um, and then we'll need to combine that with actually a detailed understanding of the physics. So we don't just want to look at the the distant black holes that we kind of see these faint sources of light that are just reaching the Earth. We want to combine that with measurements of nearby black holes that we can really study in detail mm. to, to understand the physics, understand all the processes that are the powering these things, all the processes that are growing these things. Amazing stuff. So lots and lots of work still to do, lots of things that we still don't understand. Um, you're not going to be out of a job anytime soon. So uh, that's good to know. Dan, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. It's always an absolute pleasure talking to you about these things. I could talk to you about it all all day, to be honest, but I know you have to run for another meeting. So thank you so much for taking the time as usual. I really, really appreciate it. Is there anywhere where you could point people to to learn more about this, read more about this? What's a good uh, a good resource for people to, to turn to? Um, I think for this particular discovery, actually, there's some really good resources on the European Southern Observatory, the ESO web pages. Um, ESO runs the, the very large telescope that, that made the measurements here, and they've got a fantastic press pack that links to the original paper and other related articles and um, and information. Amazing. I'll make sure that's down in the description as well as Dan's socials and Dan's work. So head over and check that out as well and check out that, that press pack that Dan mentioned. Dan, thank you so much again. I'm going to let you go because I know you've got a busy uh, afternoon ahead and uh, let's talk again soon, buddy. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much, buddy. Take care. Bye now. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions 
help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.